Welcome back. We're going to do Signs of the Times number six. And I just want to remind you that um, Rome continues in an altered form from last time. Rome continues to the end of time. So these are some of the crucial facts that we need to keep in mind as we study these prophecies. These are the facts that we need from our foundation, which is Daniel 2. Rome is depicted as a ferocious beast in Daniel 7. That's what we need to keep in mind from Daniel 7. And chapter 7 is repeating and enlarging chapter 2. Some of the features that we haven't even mentioned yet are the corresponding iron legs and the iron teeth from uh, Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. And we also have 10 toes in Daniel 2, and we have 10 horns in Daniel 7. Now, out of Rome comes a little horn. So what we're going to do now is look at who is this little horn which comes out of Rome. Daniel's vision gives us the identifying features which can identify the little horn. So we need to study what Daniel says about this little horn, and then we will be able to determine who the little horn is. So, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, and a mouth speaking great things." Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast and of the ten horns that were in his head and of the other which came up and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. I beheld and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. In other words, God's people are going to suffer at the hands of this little horn. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings. And I want you to notice that the horns and the kings are the same thing. Horns and kings, okay? That shall arise and another shall arise after them and he shall by, be diverse from the first and he shall subdue three kings. So horns represent kings, kingdoms or political powers. I want to just confirm this from Daniel 8. We're not going to study much of Daniel 8, but it just wants to show you how horns and kings and, and political powers are the same thing. The ram that they'll source having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. So horns are also kings. And the rough goat is the king of Grecia. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. So you see, kings are horns, and that is something which we need to understand as we study these prophecies. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of times. Sounds complicated, but we can work it out. So, we have ten characterizing features of the little horn which are going to help us identify who the little horn is. The first one is the little horn is a kingdom or political power. The little horn is Roman in its origin. It comes up among but after the ten horns. It destroys three of the ten horns. It is different from other horns. It is stronger than other horns. It persecutes God's people. It changes times and laws. It reigns for 1260 years because that's what times, times and the dividing of time means. And we'll explain that in a minute. It speaks great words against God. Now, there is only one power that is Roman. It is different. It is stronger. It is boastful. It is persecuting. It is religious and reigning for 1260 years. Can you guess what power that is? It doesn't take much to figure it out. It's the Roman Catholic Church. The horn, the little horn, represents the Roman Catholic Church. Possibly disturbing for some people, but I did say this would be challenging. And we cannot present pleasant truth. We have to present 
present truth. And I'm sorry if some people are upset with this, but facts remain the facts, and we have to deal with the facts as we find them. The little horn is the Roman Catholic Church, but let's see if the little let's see if the history and activity of the Catholic Church fits the activity of the little horn. Okay? So, was or is the Catholic Church a kingdom or political power? Well, the Catholic Church used to reign over a huge chunk of central Italy and some other little pieces here and there, including a part of France. And that reign started in the 700s and it continued till 1870. And in 1870, those states there in red, the papal states, were incorporated into the new Italian kingdom in 1870. But the Catholic Church regained its sovereignty in 1929 when it became the Vatican State and it was, is now recognized by all the nations of the earth as a state in its own right. And they exchange ambassadors with the world and the world sends ambassadors to the Vatican. So, yes, the Catholic Church was and is a political power. Two, is the Catholic Church Roman in its origins? Well, goodness me, it's called the Roman Catholic Church. And it's called the Roman Catholic Church because it's Roman in its origins. If a man consider the origin of this great ecclesiastical dominion, that's a fancy word for church, will easily perceive that the papacy, that's the political office of the pope, the papacy is the political office of the Pope, is no other than the ghost of the deceased Roman Empire sitting crowned upon the grave thereof. And there are many such statements from history that tell us that, yes, the, the um, Roman Catholic Church is Roman. So, yes, the Catholic Church is Roman in its origins. Did it rise to power after the Ten Horns? Well, here we have um, the fact that the Roman Empire came to its end in the year 476 AD. It was, that was when the barbarian king Odoasa deposed the last Roman Empire, Emperor. Rather. And so after that, the empire broke up, or Western Europe, the Western Europe side of it, broke up into ten kingdoms. And here you can see the Ten Kingdoms, and I think you can generally understand that um, the modern states of Europe came out of these Ten Kingdoms. Like, for example, here we have the Franks, which are obviously the modern state of France, the Anglo-Saxons as it became England and Britain. Over here, the Alemannia may not be so obvious, but the French word for Germany is Alemannia. So, you see, the Alemans are the origins of modern-day Germany. And so, these, these kingdoms rose in, after 476 AD, after the demise of the last Roman emperor. So, the Western Roman emperor broke up into ten kingdoms, and... Something happened in the year 538 AD, which is interesting. This is when an army came from the east, which was still Roman, and conquered Rome and drove out the barbarians. With the conquest of Rome by Belisarius, the history of the ancient city may be considered as terminating. And with his defense against Wittiges, AD 538, commences the history of the Middle Ages. Now, something else happened. Vigilius ascended the papal chair, A.D. 538, under the military protection of Belisarius. This is when the papacy comes to power and is put in place by a military power. So the papacy achieves supremacy 
in AD 538, which is 62 years after the rise of the Ten Horns. So we're trying to find out if the papacy arose according to the prophecy after the Ten Horns, and yes, it did according to history. So yes, the Catholic Church rose to power after the Ten Horns. Were three horns destroyed to allow the rise of the Roman Catholic Church? Yes, three Aryan nations were destroyed to make way for the supremacy of the Catholic Church. I need to explain this briefly. The Aryan nations were nations which did not agree with the Catholic Church. They were nations who thought differently. They were Christian, but they had a different understanding of Christianity than the orthodoxy, the orthodox, which was considered the Roman Catholic Church. And so therefore, in order for the papacy to reign supreme, these three Aryan nations had to be removed. And the three Aryan nations are these ones. Let me just point them out to you. The Vandals down here who settled in North Africa, the Hurali over here, which, which occupied Italy, and the other ones to be removed were the Ostrogoths up here, who after the Hurali were destroyed, the Ostrogoths moved into Italy and they too were destroyed. So the Aryan nations that stood in the way of the orthodoxy of the Roman Catholic Church were removed. And here we can get a statement from history which confirms this. It says, I might cite three that were eradicated from before the Pope. That is to say, the Hurali under Odoacer, the Vandals and the Ostrogoths. So, history confirms that three nations were destroyed. Now, there's another statement from uh, history which I really like. It says, the Roman church privily pushed itself into the place. I like that way, way it says pushed because that's the way the prophecy says it. It pushed itself into place, uprooting three of the other horns. So the Roman church privily pushed itself into the place of the Roman world empire, of which it is the actual continuation. The empire has not perished. It has only undergone a transformation. A transformation, you see, it's, it's changed from just iron to iron and clay. That is no mere clever remark, but the recognition of this true state of the matter historically and the most appropriate and fruitful way of describing the character of the church it still governs the nations, it is a political creation and is imposing as a world empire because it is the continuation of the Roman Empire. The Pope, who calls himself King and Pontifus Maximus, is Caesar's successor. So, history tells us, yes, the Roman Catholic Church plucked up three horns in order to rise to power. Is the Roman Catholic Church different from all other horns? Well, it is, and it is so because it is a combination of church and state. It has the power of both church and state, which makes it different, okay? Going back to the origins of the papacy, it says, Vigilius is the first of a series of popes more and more involved in worldly events and who no longer belongs solely to the church. So here we see the iron begins to mix with the clay. You see, the Pope Vigilius is the first to become involved with worldly affairs. Before this, popes, leaders of the church, restricted themselves to the affairs of the church. But now they become involved with politics. And the reason is because the Roman Catholic Church is a mixture of iron and clay, which is a mixture of church and state. So, I want to sh demonstrate to you that this is real Roman Catholicism by looking at the two fingers which many popes hold up when they're blessing. It's, it's a typical Roman Catholic style of introducing blessings or doing anything official, they hold up these two fingers, right? So here you have some more. Here you have Roman Catholic art with Jesus with his two fingers and, and a couple of more popes with their two fingers. 
And it's interesting that when you see a Roman Catholic church, you almost always see two towers. There, even the the, um, the Vatican itself, even though it has this single um, dome here, it has two small towers on the side here, which indicates the two tower concept. And it's telling the same story. The two fingers and the two towers are telling the same story. And what it is saying is, this is the Catholic doctrine of two swords. We are taught by the words of the gospel that in this church and under her control, there are two swords, the spiritual and the temporal. Both of these, the spiritual and the temporal swords, are under the control of the church. The first is wielded by the church. The second is wielded on behalf of the church. And that is by the states. So this is official Roman Catholic doctrine. They say that there are two swords in the church, one that the church wields directly, and there's one that is wielded by the states of the earth under the control and behalf of the church. What it, look what it says here. The first is wielded by the hands of the priest, the second by the hands of kings and soldiers, but at the wish and by the permission of the priests. Sword must be subordinate to sword, and it is only fitting that the temporal authority should be subject to the spiritual. So you see, the Catholic Church is definitely different. This is a picture depicting the Pope receiving the donation of Constantine. This is supposedly a document which the Pope received from Constantine many hundreds of years after the demise of Constantine. It's actually a fraud. It's proven to be a fraud. Even the Catholic Church proves, uh, admits that it now is a fraud, but it was used by the Catholic Church for hundreds of years to, to um, elevate its claims to be a political power. Yes, the Roman Catholic Church is different. It is a religious political power. So that is why it is stronger than the other horns, because it wields the it wields the um, the sword of the state is wielded on behalf of the church. The Pope's authority is unlimited. This is what the Pope. This is what the Catholics believe about the Pope. Incalculable. It can strike, as Innocent III says, any, wherever sin is, it can punish everyone. It allows no appeal and is itself sovereign caprice. That's a fancy way of saying that nothing, there's no authority over the sovereign power of the Pope. For the Pope carries, according to the expression of Boniface the Eighth, all rights in the shrine of his breast, as he has now become infallible. He can, by the use of the little word orbi, which means that he turns himself around to the whole church, make every rule, every doctrine, every demand into a certain and incontestable article of faith. No right can stand against him, no personal or corporate liberty, or as the Roman Catholic canonist, that's lawyers, put it, the tribunal of God and of the Pope is one and the same. In other words, they're saying that the mind of God and the mind of the Pope are the same. In other words, the Pope thinks the same thoughts as God. That's what they claim. This is the Pope's authority. So, yes, the Roman Catholic Church is more powerful than other horns, but only if you believe it. <laughs> has the Roman Catholic Church persecuted God's people? Oh, yes. The Catholic Church has the right and duty. This is Catholics talking. The Catholic Church has the right and duty to kill heretics because it is by fire and sword that heresy can be extirpated. For the highest good of the church is the unity of the faith, and this cannot be preserved unless heretics are put to death. And that was written in 1901. And even though you may think that the Catholic Church doesn't think like that anymore, unfortunately the prophecies tell us that this kind of behavior is going to come back. Jesus told us the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. And that's exactly what was happening during the reign of the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages. They thought they were doing God's service when they were killing people. This is Catholic uh, doctrine as well. No man has a right to choose his religion. 
Catholicism is the most intolerant of creeds. It is intolerance itself. We might as rationally maintain that two and two does not make four as the theory of religious liberty. Its impiety is only equaled by its absurdity. Now, if you want to exercise your own individual freedom, if you want to think freely for yourself, then the Catholic Church claims that that is not allowed. You have to submit yourself to the Pope's authority. Only the Pope can tell you what is right. You cannot determine that for yourself. So the Catholic Church automatically places itself outside the realms of republicanism and democracy because that's based on people exercising their rights to exercise their freedom of religion and the freedom of conscience. Are you beginning to see the enormity of this little horn? Did the Catholic Church persecute people? Yes, the Pope has even apologized for it. This happened just recently, this month, in the month of June. And he's in a Waldensian church in the north of Italy, apologizing to the Waldensians for the persecution of Catholics against Waldensians. If you were ever to read the history of the Waldensian church, you will be horrified at the things that the Catholic church did to these people. And it's amazing that they still survive today. But we are totally un in their debt, the Waldensian people, because they kept the scriptures alive. They used to copy the scriptures up in the mountains of Italy and they used to distribute them around to anybody who was willing to take them and to read them. And of course, the Bible was illegal in those days. You couldn't read the Bible. It was, uh, and if you were caught with a Bible, you would be burned at the stake with the Bible around your neck. So these terrible things happened and the Waldensians were the ones who kept the light alive. So yes, the Pope, the Catholic Church has definitely persecuted people and the Pope even admits it here. But my friends, I don't want you to be confused about um, the Pope apologizing. Um, even though he apologizes in public in this manner, it doesn't mean that the Catholic Church has changed. In fact, it boasts that it never changes. It only acts in this way when it cannot act any other way. It's not possible for the Catholic Church to persecute people in the same way that it persecuted them in the past. It hasn't risen back into the same power that it used to have, but it's on its way. Look at what it says in the book of Revelation. Now, here we have a picture of a woman sitting on a seven-headed beast with ten horns. Now, this is a repetition and enlargement of the beast that we have in Revelation 13, which is an enlargement of the beast that we find in Revelation 7. So this is also the Roman Catholic Church. It's simply an enlargement, a repetition and enlargement. We now have a woman sitting on the beast. So that's adding more information to what we already know about the Roman Catholic Church. And I don't want to get into exactly what this woman represents or why she's sitting on the Roman Catholic Church, but I just want to show you what it says about her and her activities because we're talking about the persecution of God's people by the Roman Catholic Church and apparently, because the Roman Catholic Church doesn't do that today, it will never do it again. Well, that's not true, because look what it says. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Now, that last little bit there can be a little confusing. John is not saying that he admires what he's looking at here. That's not what he's saying at all. He's saying he's absolutely stunned by what he sees. He's stunned by what he sees this, this woman riding the beast is up to. He's stunned because he sees that, that she's responsible for all the blood of the saints, which has been shed all through history. 
And it also says, and in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. How many people are excluded in that little word all? There are none. It says that this woman riding the beast is responsible for all the blood of the saints shed through history. Now, the book of Revelation tells us that there are more perse there's more persecution to come and there's more death. I'm sad to say that, but this woman is also responsible for that. When the Roman Catholic Church comes totally and utterly back to power, because it used to reign over the nations of the earth and it will reign over the nations again, and this is what the signs of the times are telling us, persecution will begin again. Sad, I'm sorry. I did say that this was going to be challenging to understand and, and to accept, but this is what the prophecies tell us and this is what the signs of the times tell us. The Roman Catholic Church is almost there. There is a reason why the last pope resigned and we now have a Jesuit pope. For the first time in history, we have a Jesuit pope and that is very significant. But we will perhaps maybe get into some of that detail at a later time. Right now, we want to just talk about the little horn and how it would persecute God's people. So yes, the Roman Catholic Church has a long history of persecution. Has the Roman Catholic Church changed God's times and laws? Yes. Wherefore, no marvel if it be in my power, this is the Pope talking, to dispense with all things, yea, the precepts of Christ, yea, the laws of Christ. I can change them, he says. I have the power to do that. And has he done it? Yes. We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church in the Council of Laodicea in the year 364 AD transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. And that's, one of the, that's from the Converts Catechism. That's official Catholic doctrine. A catechism is a book which is given to somebody who's becoming a Catholic. And they are given the book to study so that they know what Catholic teaching is. And here is another catechism. Had she not power, she could not have substituted the observance of Sunday, the first day of the week, for the observance of Saturday, the seventh day of the week, a change for which there is no scriptural authority. You know, many people believe that there is scriptural authority for the change of Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. But there is not. Many people have offered thousands of dollars, even a million dollars to people to, if they can prove that from Scripture that we should now worship on Sunday and it is not possible to prove it. It's just not there. But the Catholics claim to have changed it and they did. They are responsible for changing God's law, times and laws. And here you can see the original Ten Commandments on the left and the Ten Commandments as the Catholics have them on the right. And you can see that the Fourth Commandment, for example, tells us that the Sabbath is the seventh day of the week and the Fourth Commandment as the Catholics have it, it oh sorry, they have that as the Third Commandment, it just says remember to keep the Sabbath day holy. And they've removed the the um, second commandment completely because that's the one which says that you should not worship craven images. So yes, they have definitely changed the law. All right. Yes, the Catholic Church claims or admits to changing times and laws. Did the Roman Catholic Church reign historically for 1260 years? Well, if we go back to Vigilis, who ascended the papal chair in 538, under the military protection of Belisaurus, that tells us when the papacy achieved supremacy. And then the papacy was abolished in 78 when, when Napoleon's general Belisaurus went into Rome and he closed down the papacy. The, Cath the uh, Encyclopedia Britannica tells us in 19... Sorry, in 1798, General Berthier made his entrance into Rome, abolished the papal government and established a secular one. 
And a Roman Catholic Jesuit priest tells us that Berthia entered Rome on the 10th of February 1798 and proclaimed a republic. No wonder that half of Europe thought the papacy was dead. Well, it came back to life again, but much later in the year 1929. But at this point, we can see that the medieval church reigned for 1260 years between 538 AD and 1798. So yes, it reigned for 1260 years. Now, how do we work it out? Because the prophecy says it reigned for a time, times, and the dividing of time. So one time equals one year, two times equals two years, dividing of time is half a year. So we have a total of three and a half years. Now, a biblical year is 360 days. So 360 days times three and a half is 1260 days. Now, in prophecy, a day equals a year. And there you have the, the Bible text to prove it. So, yes, the little horn would reign for 1260 years. Now, I'd like to show you how we can confirm this because this prophecy is mentioned seven times in Scripture. Now, what does that tell us? If something is mentioned seven times, it's probably meant to tell us that this is important. But it's mentioned seven times in different ways. You see, in, in um, Revelation 11, for example, it says, straight out 1260 days and in Revelation 13 verse 5 it says 40 in two months which is also 1260 days you understand so every single one of these in the, these uh, times it's mentioned it works out to be 1260 days which makes 1260 years according to Bible prophecy so this is the time 1260 years of persecution and death during the Dark Ages, and it's been calculated that anywhere between 60 and 100 million people lost their lives at this time. And all they ever wanted to do was simply read the Bible or worship according to their own conscience, and, but that was not permitted because the Catholic Church reigned over everybody and everything, and including the conscience of the people. So, no freedom. So, if... Let me just explain one thing to you here. If you are enjoying your freedom at the moment and your freedom to, uh, to think as you want to and to worship as you want to, then you owe a huge debt to these people who kept this alive, this idea of freedom alive during this time. It's Christian people who are the foundation of freedom in this world. Seriously, my friends. Christianity preserved it. So you, we need, even if we're not Christian, we need to acknowledge what these people went through in order that you and I can be free to speak what we want to speak. Okay. Yes, the Roman Catholic Church reigned for exactly 1260 years. Does the Roman Catholic Church make great boastful claims against God? This is the last point. Yes. Let me just point out some of them. Supreme authority over church and state? Yes, they claim that. The right to kill heretics? Yes, they claim that. The right to change God's laws? Yes, they claim that. The right to forgive sins? Yes, they claim that. Claiming to be God on earth? Yes. No salvation outside the Roman Catholic Church? Yes. Claiming authority over the individual conscience? Yes. God's representative on earth? Yes. And there are many more such claims. For example, the Pope claims to be infallible. So, yes, <laughs> these are great claims. And many of them, most of them, are against the Most High. They're in, in other words, they're impinging on God's territory. Yes, the Roman Catholic Church makes great boastful claims against God. So there's no question about it. The Roman Catholic Church fulfills all the requirements of the prophecy, and the Roman Catholic Church is the little horn. But the prophecy goes on to say, But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume it and to destroy it unto the end. So Revelation repeats and enlarges the prophecies of Daniel and we're going to go to Revelation next and we're going to see how this story pans out because there's much more interesting things to come and much more interesting things as we associate these things in prophecy with the signs of the times. So 
we're going to go to Revelation next time and please read Revelation 13 and we'll see you next time. In the meantime, before we go, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I will trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the fowler. The fowler is someone who sets traps. Who's that? <laughs> I think you know. We are going to be delivered from him who sets traps and from the noisome pestilence he shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shall thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. His truth is going to be your defense. We need God's truth in the last days. We need his truth to preserve us from deception. We need to be on God's side. I'll see you next time with our next presentation. Music